Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yes. Welcome to uh, part four of Knowing God. And we're actually going to, we have a lot of ground to cover today, so we'll see if I get near any of it. But um, I will actually mention a few attributes of God today. But there's some other things that we need to uh, say to lead up to it. I'm, I'm really excited about this. So let's pray. Our Lord and our God, it's good to gather together in your house with your children, our brothers and sisters, Father, to spend time studying your word and learning more about you. Lord, there's no greater subject, no greater topic, no greater person to study, to know about, Father. And Lord, we are just so excited to have this opportunity. And as we've said every time that we met, Lord, please don't ever let this turn into a simply an academic uh, venture, Father. Lord, help this to be something that would truly draw us close to you, uh, yes. that we might worship you in awe and in yes. reverence, Lord. What a beautiful worship time we had last night, Father. We thank you for that. And Lord, I... Uh, I just pray that as we dig in deeper to understand who you are and why you are, Father, that we're just drawn close to you. So encourage your people today that, Father, we might find our peace and rest in you. Whatever burdens we may be carrying today, Father, Lord, we don't want to sweep them under the carpet or deny them, Lord. We just lay them before you, place them at the foot of the cross, asking that in your benevolent providence that you would intervene and mold us and shape us to be the children of God you want us to be. So Father, thank you for this time. Bless this time for your sake and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, I wanted to, um, last time we, I didn't finish a few verses that I wanted to talk to you about, about knowing God, about what it means <coughs> to know God, how we know God, etc., which will get us into the next thing I want to talk about today, which I'm hoping we're finished, is I want to talk about some of the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. And you say, well, we believe in God, let's move on. Well, you're going to see how even these philosophical arguments show us the magnificent attributes of, of God. So I'm excited about that. So let's look here at this verse in John 14, 1 through 4. I read these probably in every memorial service uh, that I do. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. Now here's the key. You know the way to the place where I am going. Okay, now you probably remember the very next thing that's gonna come up here. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Now, this is not to imply that Thomas was an unbeliever. He's not grasping the concept of what the Lord's talking about here. You're going somewhere, what, what, what way? How, how, we don't know the way. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. Yes. Now, why is Jesus telling the disciples at this point that they do know him? Because they know Jesus. And this also, now you can debate as to when did the disciples come to faith? Did they come to faith at Pentecost? Did they come to faith when they were first called? Did they come to faith when they had the Lord's Supper? We don't need to debate that right now. I'm looking at it right here, and it says, you know him. So they've come to faith by God's, by God's grace. So from now on, you do know him, and I've seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. So again, he's, Philip's missing the point. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Not saying that Philip doesn't know. Philip's just not grasping 
the whole concept of this knowing. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you now? That just something just popped in my head for the very first time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So what about the the Pharisees? What about the you know the shopkeeper that's running a shop and Jesus goes in to buy a loaf of bread real quick for his mom? Uh, have they seen the Father? Well, I guess in one sense they wouldn't even know it. But I think what he's saying here is if you anyone who has seen me. I think it means when their eyes are open, they see who Christ is, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? About, oh no, okay, so I want, I want to just stop right there. So you saw that whole thing about knowing. Now, here are some of the most amazing verses in the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. In other words, we'll get into it. Well, I'm going to talk about a spiritual wisdom, not a wisdom of the world. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None, I get this, none of the rulers of this age understood it. Why didn't they understand it? Understand the gospel. Spiritually yeah, they weren't spiritually alive. They're spiritually dead. The veil was over their, their eyes. He didn't have to say just the rulers of this age. He could have said any unbeliever, but he was making a point. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord in glory. However, as it is written, now, I'm going to show you a verse that this verse is completely misunderstood by most people. No, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. Every time I hear someone quote this verse, they think they're talking about heaven. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what, uh, or conceived the things God has prepared for us, meaning when we get the glory. That's not what it's talking about. In one sense, it's true. But that's not what it's talking about. However it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, who's Jesus talking about right now? Who is the who's? Who have not seen, have not heard, and cannot even conceive of? Unbelievers. He's talking about unbelievers. The things God has prepared for those who love him. Elaine, do you love Jesus? Yeah. Why do you love Jesus? Um, That's a trick question. What's that? Because he loves me. Very good. Because he first loved you. Yes. He spoke his love into your heart, and now you're able to love him. Unbelievers do not love God. They may say they do, but what they're loving is a form of God, but denying its power, it says in Timothy. They're, they're, they're loving a, a God of Romans chapter 1, where they made their own God, whatever that, that is. So he's talking the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are things God has revealed to us by his spirit. When he spoke life into us, now we see. So no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived is true for the unbeliever. But now we have seen. All right, let's move on now. I'm not done. 12, 13. What we have received as a gift is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. See, we can't understand until the spirit is freely given us, placed within our heart. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit. That goes back, and I'm going to get to those Latin words again. Those other beliefs, those Latin, well, I, I promise you, I think it's the next slide. Those are human beliefs, notitia and ascensus, and that's what it says. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom. Human wisdom can teach a person um, the facts about God and that the truth and about Jesus and those facts are true. But in words taught by the Spirit, that fiducia of faith that brings salvation to us, explaining spiritual realities with spirit taught words the person without the spirit who's the person without the spirit unbeliever. unbeliever 
does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. How many of you, before you came to faith, I know some of you were brought up in a church environment, but you came to faith when you were 15 or whatever, but how many of you who were not brought up in a religious Christian environment, but came to faith later on, that you thought all this Christianity was foolishness? It was foolish. Well, what are they talking about? A man died on a cross 2,000 years ago and rose from the dead. And now, because I say, I believe, I believe that to be true, I trust that, my sins are forgiven, that's nonsense. Okay, that's exactly what they're going to say. Scripture says that. Uh, but here, but consider them foolishes and cannot understand them. Why can't they understand them? It's not that they just don't want to. They can't. Why not? Because they're blinded. They're spiritually dead. I mean, this is so beautiful when you, when you think about it. It's sadly beautiful, if you know what I mean. Because they are discerned only through the Spirit. For who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. See, when the Spirit of Christ comes within us, now we have Christ who is life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now we can begin to understand. Not that we understand everything. We're still learning. You're, you're learning today. I'm learning. I'm, I'm, I can't remember the exact example, but last week I was reading, as I was reading the scripture to you, I said, oh my goodness, I never saw that before in my life. And it was like, I just learned something. So that was the spirit. We have the mind of Christ teaching us those things. Okay, see, I'm getting so excited here. <laughs> All right, so very quickly, we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but on your, your chart that I handed out to you, if you don't have it, there's one or two copies there, but just so you see this, this is the redeemed man. Remember the unredeemed man, Christ is out of their life. Christ was on the outside, and their spirit, their nose being, the old man, unredeemed self, old sinful nature, was spiritually dead. Now we have Christ in us. But this should say, and maybe your paper does, I'm not sure, redeem man in the flesh. Yeah. Now that's a Christian. But you see, why is he in the flesh? What, what do you see there that tells you he's in the flesh? What do you see in the dead center of the whole diagram? Self. 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 I'm on the throne. You've heard that said, get, get off the throne. Let Christ on the throne. Well, that's a... A true reality here is that many, many of us, I won't say many, many of them, many, many of us, and we go back and forth in this, is that we love Jesus, Jesus saved us, but today I'm in the flesh. That doesn't mean I lost my salvation, but I got, let's just make up, I got so mad when I came in here this morning, this table wasn't here. And now I'm, I'm really teasing right now because I, I don't get mad about it hardly anything but I'm just making something up that happened this table wasn't here I need this table so I'm looking all over if it's not here it's usually on the platform from the youth last night couldn't find it you know anywhere so I did my typical Thursday morning thing I text your son-in-law <laughs> Alex where's that table I always use he comes two seconds later. He comes walking out who's in the hallway I walked right past it he didn't even see it. now someone else might get all upset about that. I have to have, have to teach my class. How am I going to push the button if I can't, you know, do that? It doesn't mean I'm not a Christian. It means I'm in the flesh. I'm, I'm getting worked up for no reason. So what we're talking about, and flesh, remember, is your soul and your body. It's your mind, the way you think, feel, and choose. That's your flesh, which we're going to have until we get a new body. So live with it, you know? And so when we sin, we sin in the flesh. Here is redeemed man in the spirit, where we're living, we're trusting Christ in all things. Again, we I can't say that we live this way every single day. Once you come to the awareness of it, you're in the spirit every day. Because as long as we have this flesh here, we're gonna blow it. You're you're gonna watch the uh, FSU L, uh, Louisiana LSU game, which was probably the greatest football game I ever saw in my life. Obviously, there's no FSU fans here. <laughs> you have been so conditioned, okay? You've been so conditioned by the Gator mentality around here. That's okay. You know, but if you were an LSU fan, you might, as a Christian, and you love Jesus, you might have jumped off the couch 15 times, yelling and screaming at the TV set, at the ballplayers. That's not walking in the spirit. 
okay? And so here Christ is the center and we see all those other good things coming. Okay, I just wanted you to see that. But now, I wanted to, because I didn't plan on sharing this with you last week, I wanted to at least put it up here, read you a couple of verses, and then we're going to move on, because this is important stuff. All right, so here's these three kinds of faith that St. Augustine talked about. Notitia, the facts about something. Born in Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph, died on a cross, had 12 disciples, rose from the dead, you know, ascended to heaven, Pontius Pilate, you know, so they're the facts. A census is believing the facts to be true. Again, I believe, and I did for the first 19 years of my life. I had an a census faith in Jesus Christ. I believe those facts to be true. You say, well, then you were a Christian. No, because as I read to you or said to you last week or whenever, it tells us in James that you believe in one God, great. Even the demons believe that and tremble. So having an ascensus faith just puts you in the category of a demon. <laughs> Sorry, but you have the same faith as a demon. Saving faith is fiducia. It's a trusting faith. And this is a God-given faith that's placed within you by God's grace that now makes you alive and now you cling to him. Now you love him. Now you trust him. I want to show you a couple of examples here in Mark 10, you're going to see all three of these in this story of blind Bartimaeus. They, then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So at least we see a notitia faith here is that he had heard of Jesus. He heard something about Jesus or else he wouldn't have cried out to him. Is that thunder? Yes. Amen. Oh no, the Lord's saying amen. <laughs> I should not be so presumptuous. Is God would send thunder as an amen to me. I am sorry, Lord. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Definitely. All right. That's why I wore my sneakers today. Okay, so he's heard about Jesus, but the story continues. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. He knew the facts. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up. On your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, which is a sermon in itself. I heard that sermon once. <sighs> there's two times. I can't remember the other reference, but there's another reference of a sinner throwing his coat aside and going to the Jesus God. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Amen. So now we know he doesn't just know about Jesus. He hasn't just heard that he's a miracle man. He believes those facts to be true. Because I want to see, and that's why I'm calling on you to show me mercy. A census. He believed Jesus could heal him. And then one last verse. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight, and here's the clincher, and followed Jesus along the road. Now the writer of this gospel did not have to put that last sentence in. Because what was the miracle? That he got his sight. End of story. Okay? But the important part is that he followed Jesus. Now he, now, again, we don't know this man, we don't know the details, but the implication from nothing is in the scripture for no reason is that he's following Jesus. I, I, I love it with the uh, 10 lepers. They all got healed. They all knew about him, believed him to be true. Only one came back and worshiped him. That's the one with the fiducia, you know, faith, okay? Now, Realizing that man can only know or believe or trust in God by God's revealing and saving grace, we can now look at the very existence of God. Now you're saying again, we already believe in God. But I want to show you what the scriptures say and what philosophers have said about the existence of God. And this is going to be, I believe, encourage you because all the more you're going to see why we worship this great God that is so 
transcendent, so different than us. Now, I love that the Bible starts, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you realize the Bible does not try <coughs> to prove to anyone that God exists. If a man was writing this, I'm talking a human writing this, he would probably go to great lengths to prove to you why this God was real. And you can see it in other teachings. You can see it in L. Ron Hubbard's and Scientology when he goes into his, you know, crazy, you know, science fiction stories about the Thetans and the volcanoes and the hydrogen bombs. Is that he's got to write all of this stuff to prove, which it doesn't prove it. It proves he's insane, you know. But the Bible simply says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth does not go into any more explanation as to why, who, where does God come from, any of those, those things right there. It just states that he is. Hebrews 11.6 And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now once again, here's a verse that we misunderstand too. Yes, it is true that we need to live our life by faith. Every day live by faith, and that's pleasing to the Lord. But this is talking about saving faith. Without saving faith, I'll show you why in a second. Without saving faith, it's impossible to please God. If you're not a Christian, are you pleasing to God? No, I hate to tell you the truth. Scripture says you're enemies. Oh, we're not enemies. I just didn't worship him like you do. No, Scripture says if you're not for me, you're against me. And while we were yet enemies... Okay, so without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So we have to believe that he exists. And you know why we believe he exists? Not because of the philosophical arguments I'm going to show you, which are good and helpful, but because he spoke life into you. And because he changed you, you now believe. And you believe in God. You believe God exists. You don't have all the answers. None of us do. I mean, if you, if, if, if you are surrounded by intellectual skeptics, whatever, and you come in one day and, and say at work to your, all your physicists, you know, at the engineering plant you work at, whatever, and you say, hey, guy, how was your weekend? Let me tell you how my weekend was. I went to church for the first time in 50 years. And I heard this gospel message and my eyes were opened up. And I now believe and trust that Jesus Christ is really who the Bible says he is. And he forgave me my sins and, and washed them away. And they're going to look at him and go, you're nuts. And then they're going to say, well, prove it. Prove to me that God is, is real. At that point, you're a new convert. What's the only thing you can say? Prove that he's not. I was blind. Yeah, well, prove that he's not. I was blind, but now I see. I have an experience. Now, we don't live by experience. You know, that we always got to be careful of that, is that I'm all for an emotional experience. I'm, I'm not denying that. But we got to be careful of an emotional experience being the evidence that one is saved. Is because you convince someone, someone I've told you before, I think, if your friend, the husband just left them and they're brokenhearted and crying and it happened yesterday and they go, I'm, I'm miserable, life is over. And you say, oh, I'm sorry. Let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus will bring comfort, whatever. What's that person gonna say, possibly? Yes. Yeah, because what do they want? Comfort. They want comfort, they want their husband back. But what is it they, not the matter what they want, what do they need? They need forgiveness. They need to be reconciled. You know, and so that's that's what we got to be careful. Uh, I'm all for if someone's going a tough time, share the gospel with them. But make sure you don't promise them something that Jesus didn't say he was going to deliver right away. Oh, he'll bring them a peace. He'll bring them a comfort. But he didn't say he'd bring his husband back. He could. What the deal is right now, you need to be forgiven of your sins. That's the important thing, okay? So, they must come to faith in him and believe in him. So, believing in God comes to us by God's grace. 
Plenty of people know about God. How many of you knew about God, but you didn't know God? Okay? And here's the interesting thing. God is omniscient. He knows all things. But we do understand from the scriptures that he doesn't, hang on, know everyone. And by that I mean what? Yes, he doesn't know them intimately. Let me show you this example, an amazing example in the uh, Minor Prophet of Amos. You don't have to turn to it because it'll take you too while, long to get there. But try to get there and underline it, but I'm going to show it to you. Amos 3, 1 and 2, verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you. Now, this is a negative word, a, a, a rebuke. But he's talking to his children. O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought you up from the land of Egypt, saying, okay, so we're starting off on a bad foot here because he's rebuking them. But listen to what he says next. And I'm going to read this to you from the King James, then the uh, NIV. <coughs> You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, because I'm your father, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Now, anyone see a problem with that? When you just read it just as it is? Knowing the character of God, the magnitude of God, the omniscience of God? What is he saying there that seems to contradict that? You only have I known of all the families of the earth? Is, does that mean that Lord is looking at the Israelites and saying, oh, I, I know you got, oh, wait a minute. There's people living on the other side of this mountain. Who are they? I didn't know there were people on the other side of the mountain because I only know you. There's, and there's people over there too? No, we know that's, that's silly. What is he really saying? NIV. Only you have I chosen of all the families of the earth. And we know the scriptures tell us that the Israelites are the chosen people. And so the NIV says the word that is used here, known, has to be that intimacy. Adam knew Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. I always like to joke about it, and I did it last week. Adam didn't say, oh, I know you. Oh, my, you're pregnant now. <laughs> That's not how it works. Okay, Adam knew Eve intimately. He chose Eve to be his own. God, God gave it to her, whatever. But I wanted you to see here about what it means to know God intimately. We know that the Jews were chosen people. And they weren't chosen or intimately known because they were good. And I meant to look up the verse and I forgot to do it. In Deuteronomy, somewhere it says that talking to the Jews, I didn't choose you because you were the largest group or the smartest group or the nicest group, you know. Basically, I chose you because I chose you. And that God has a, a, a right to do that. So, belief in God is a gift from God. But, we can be involved in what our see, and see this, so, what I'm getting at is that believing in God is a supernatural thing. So you might think, well, I, I guess I'll share the gospel with them, but it's up to God to save. Well, we know that to be true. It's absolutely true. But God has chosen to use your prayers, your evangelism, your testimony to bring someone to faith. You didn't bring them to faith or the testimony. Oh, we, we gotta have Steve share his testimony because it is so powerful. A hundred people will get saved right now. No, you know, he could very well. But the Lord could say to someone else, I'll just, you know, pick on someone. Elaine, I don't know if you were brought up a Christian, but just say, well, no, we won't pick on Elaine. This guy sitting right here, who's been brought up in the faith, came to faith at an early age, has lived a very humanly righteous life, not perfect, but he hasn't been involved in any vile sin. So he gets up and shares his testimony and says, well, you know, we, we, uh, I, I don't, I never was in jail and I never got a speed ticket. And I was always obedient to my parents and stuff. But I realized one day sitting in a church service and I heard the gospel shared 
that I was still a sinner. And actually, I'm one of the hardest types to come to faith because I'm the type of people, person who doesn't think they need a savior. But I realized that no matter how good I was in human standards, I was still lost and dead in my sin. 100 people get saved. Now, why did 100 people get saved? Trick question, be careful. Well, <laughs> okay, that, okay, because I'm, I was a trick question, and yes, you're you're right, but ultimately the reason is is because God said, "I'm saving you," and He used that simple testimony, or He used the gut wrenching testimony. How many of us have heard horrifying testimonies? They spent 45 minutes telling us the horror they went through and then said, and then one day I was in church and Jesus saved me. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, that person spent a lot of time talking about themselves and their story and then threw in that Jesus saved me. You know, your testimony is, I was a sinner, I was dead in my sin, and I didn't know that until the Spirit revealed it to me and showed me I was dead. I was as dead as that person and that person and that person. You know, when you walk into a cemetery and you see all these gravestones, you know nothing about any of those people. You don't know if that was a murderer, if he was an adulterer, if he was a, a drug, a seller of drugs, if he was involved in child pornography. You don't know any of that. What's the only thing you know about them? Yeah. They're dead. I wasn't planning on telling you that, but I think that's important. That's good to know. That we're all dead. And it's only by his grace that he opens our eyes that we might see that. So, I want to show you now, and this is going to make sense, about some of the arguments for the existence of God. And this is what R.C. Sproul calls pre-evangelism. By sharing this with someone, some of these arguments, philosophical arguments about why we believe in a God won't necessarily save someone, but God could use it to save someone. Right. You understand, it wasn't your convincing argument that saved someone. It was the Lord's Spirit that we just read, saves. But I want to share these with you because it'll be helpful in the conversation. But they also point to the attributes of God. So here's some of the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. You're going to learn some real big words. Do not show off this weekend that you know these words because you go back to my very first lesson that said this intellectual assent to big words does not make you more spiritual. Okay, yes, pride coming before the fall. All right, the first one here is the what's called, let me make sure I have my notes with me. Okay. Is called the uh, cosmological argument. Cosmo coming from cos uh, cosmic, coming from the word cosmos, the universe. And this argument considers the principle of cause and effect. And this is all going to make only one of these is going to be like, what are you talking about? And I'm still grasping it. The first three I want to share with you, you're going to say, yeah, that makes absolute sense. Okay, so it has to do with cause and effect because each cause is an effect of a prior cause. So St. Thomas Aquinas from the 13th century spoke extensively about this argument. And he broke, it, he broke down the cosmological argument down further to a few, two sub-arguments. The first one has to do with motion. Is that a prime mover? And what he's saying here is that each thing in the universe that moves has been moved by something else. Now, when you hear this logic, you're gonna say, well, duh, but it has baffled philosophers for years, okay? So, you get in your car, you start your car, you put it in drive, it moves. What caused the car to move? You did. I did, the engine, all of that. But I had to get into the car. So I moved to get into the car. But then what caused me to move? And the point is, is that, and, and this is, I don't want to get too weird on you here this year, but I want you really to put on your thinking caps, you know, about this. Is that he's talking here about 
a previous series of events. For anything to occur, something had to occur prior to it to move such and such. Okay? All right? And that's very important. Aristotle, who lived about 300 BC, he reasoned that a series of movers must have begun with the first prime mover that itself has not been moved or acted upon by another agent. I'll explain. Aristotle sometimes called this prime mover God, but Aristotle wasn't a believer. He sometimes called it God. Aquinas understood it to be the God of Christianity. Now, I want you to put on your thinking caps. Why does there have to be a first or prime mover that gets the ball rolling? Why, has, why does there have to be an unmovable force God to start everything. I want you to think. Because it makes sense. It is impossible to pass through an infinite series of moments. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. You have, uh, we have 10 seconds ago. We have five minutes ago. We have 10 minutes ago. We have 60 minutes ago. We have a day ago. We have a week ago. We have a month ago. We have a year to go. For us to be in this moment right now, time had to what? Start somewhere because you can't keep going back into infinity with moments because if you do, you're never going to get to right now. Boy, I wish I had a dry marker board to illustrate that for you. I'm, and this, is, this is really important to understand, so let's, let's do it again. The fact that we are living in the now indicates there had to be a start for us to get to now. If there was no start, then where did time begin to get us here? And so there's a point to it, is that scientists would say, and it goes into the next one, as an next argument as well, is that, well, the universe is infinite. It's gone on for forever and ever, but that's impossible because we couldn't be living this moment right now unless there was a starting point. Start, now we move forward until we get to 10 years, five years, one year, three months, one month, one week, one day, today. Understand? Yes. Okay, don't, I, I, I'll, I'll gladly, because it's important to understand this because this will point out to us the eternity of God. Amen. Beginning of, of God, that God started everything. Logic demands something eternally existed and that is not itself the effect of anything else. Something, someone, has to start it all. That doesn't mean that prior to that, God was not doing anything or, or whatever. Remember, God's outside of time. Time started with God. See, this is something that's beyond our comprehension. We can't comprehend what's existence without time. Time. Everything is based on time. We started at exactly 9.30. And I would do everything in my power to stop at 10.30. You have appointments you have to go to. Everything's based on, on time. God's outside of time. So God's looking in one sense at a thousand years ago, the day you were born, the day you came to faith, today, and what's going to happen to you six years from now. Because he's outside of time, which is good news. He's not just an observer. He's a sovereign God. So he's in control. So he's, he's, we, can, we can rest in that. But I'm, I'm hoping you're catching this point here. Is that there has to be a prime first mover. Since you can't go through, it's impossible to go through an infinite series of regresses or moments. Because if you keep going back, you're never going to start. So you're never going to get here today. And I'll be honest with you, philosophers have a tough time with this. Secular philosophers. 
So they kind of come up with some mumbo jumbo of how to get around it, but it's, it's tough to, you know, come up with, you know, with that. For us to be here today, again, then something had to start the domino effect of future causes. You can't keep going backwards infinity. And logic points to God, the uncreated, eternal measure of all things, the first cause of our reality. Now, I want you to think about this. Here are some characteristics that this first cause would have to have, and this will show us his attributes. First, it, the first cause, would rely on nothing for its existence. If it needed anything else, it would be an effect instead of a cause. For God to have been created, then that is a cause and effect. That means something had to create God. And that's what the little kids ask all the time. Who made God? Uh, well, God made himself. Well, how did God make himself out of nothing? If he wasn't existent, then how did he come into existence? Well, no. The simple answer is God has always been. God is e eternal. So he would be an eternal God, which is an attribute of God. Secondly, this force that started the movement would be powerful enough to create the something from nothing. Because to have that first movement, he started with nothing. Heavens and the earth were created ex nihilo, out of nothing. How can something how can nothing create something? You see, so this being had to be powerful enough to create something from nothing. Obviously, if it alone existed, anything it made would have to be created from nothing. And so this is an attribute of his omnipotence. He has all power. So, so far in this one argument, we've seen the eternality of God and his omnipotence. Thirdly, this prime mover would also have to be intelligent and have the will, the desire to create or to not create. So here's his attributes of sovereignty and omniscience. He knew what he was doing when he started the ball rolling, the domino. Have you ever seen... Um, What's the fellow's name who first came up with the idea and they drew comics? And you can watch on YouTube some really funny things where you, you touch this domino and it hits these dominoes and then it hits this bowling ball and the bowling ball goes down here and it's got a name. It's named after a guy who you know, has done that. All this cause and effect. Someone had to start that going and had to be intelligent enough to see all the consequences of that. So again, the attributes of sovereignty and omniscience. Um, fourth, this cause would have to exist outside of the universe it would create. So he came out from outside this universe to create it. This is an attribute of his omnipresence, that he's everywhere. So these characteristics only make sense when applied to a powerful conscious being, conscious being that exists outside of the universe with the will and the ability to create. These are the characteristics or attributes of God, which are revealed beginning in the book of Genesis and extended through the entire Bible. So this cosmological argument for the existence of God centers on the activity of motion and, um, and causation. He's the first cause of everything, you know, as well. Time, material, life, the universe had to start somewhere, somehow, sometime, and by someone. And isn't it interesting? What is science saying right now about how everything was created? A big bang. Think about this. They're saying that a big bang started everything. So they're admitting to a start. But what's the problem with their view of the Big Bang? Who started the, Who started the Big Bang? What material did you have to start a, a Big Bang? Where did it come from? 
You see, so they're heading in a slightly right correct uh, direction and they're beginning to realize there is a start, but how did that universe, you know, start? Into the God particle. What's that? The God particle. The God particle, exactly. So something had to cause it to bang. And that something is a someone with a capital S, someone, yes. and that being God. Not only does Genesis 1-1 tell us in the beginning, the start, God created the heavens and the earth, but look what it says here in, I think I have it here. First, uh, first Corinthians, first Colossians, Colossians 1, 15 to 17. The sun is the, now, I love these three verses. You probably read them a hundred times. Think about it deeply in terms of what we're talking about. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That does not mean he was born. That means he's the prototype, the best. For in him, all things were created. Who's the him? Christ. Yeah, we're talking about Christ, the Son. In him, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him, and get this, for him. It's not about us. It's all about him. He is before all things. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. He's before all things. Yes. And in him, all things hold together. Yes. Now, I heard it said years ago, and my, my father-in-law, yes. my late father-in-law was an engineer, deep-thinking scientist that loved Jesus, that some would through, use the term the Colossian factor. Why do, why are you able to sit in that chair and your atoms, your electrons aren't flying all over the place? What's holding you together? And that's one thing that physicists still have a difficult time grasping of the molecular level of why is everything held together? Why are those yellow garbage cans still there and they were there yesterday? Why have they not just, and some say, oh, it's the Colossians factor that in Christ, he holds all things together. Okay, the next argument. Any questions on that? Okay, there's cosmology. The cosmological has to do with motion or really cause and effect. The fact that things have happened where they are, it's because they've been a cause, a first cause. The next is the teleological argument has to do with purpose, design, and you probably heard uh, lots about this, but haven't really, didn't have a big name for it. This examines the structure of the universe. The largest galactic configurations, our solar system, our DNA, some atomic particles, everything gives the appearance of having been purposefully arranged. I mean, that's why we stand in awe. That's why we look out at the stars the creation and are in awe of how this has all come together. You talk about a miracle. You talk about how in the world did intelligence, what's what's the second law of thermodynamics? Nothing can be created or destroyed. Say it again. Nothing can be created Yes. Yeah. What's the law of entropy? Everything declines. Have you ever noticed that when a building, a company is abandoned, a company moves out and leaves the building vacant. What happens to it? It's weird. What happens to it in a couple years? It falls apart. Now, I don't think it's because humans aren't in it. I think it's because no one's going out and repainting it, whatever, but things decline. And here, you and I are the perfect example of that. We're not getting better physically were declining, things slow down. But what do evolutionists say? That we started with nothing, got something, and that something has evolved to be these great thinkers, moral people with, with brains that can make computers and build skyscrapers. That goes completely against the whole you know, idea of, of that. So this trait is so strong that even hardened atheists have difficulty explaining away the appearance of design. The scientists can predict when Halley's Comet's coming again. 
you know, they, they can tell you what the star configuration was, you know, a thousand years ago, because it can be predicted or ascertained through study because of the purpose, the design of everything. Yet if they were not exactly as they are, complex matter and life would be impossible. If circumstances weren't just right, dozens of universal constants coordinate in mind-boggling uh, precision to make life possible. Have you heard it said that if the earth, I don't know the distance was much closer to the sun, is that it'd be, it'd be too hot, no life. If we were a little bit further from it, too cold, couldn't live. The earth is in the perfect spot to sustain life. They call that the Goldilocks zone. They say it again? They call that the Goldilocks zone. Goldilocks zone, very good. Yeah, yeah. Not too cold, just right. Just, yeah, I get you. But that's, that's, that's great. But how everything has just come to, together. Science has never observed or explained life arising from non-life. Yet it's what they always say, is that life came from non-life. Yet it also shows a sudden onset of complex organisms that um, I don't want to get too much into this, but it definitely talks about an intelligent design designer. And of course, as soon as that's brought up and scientists, evolutionists freak out and whatever, but it's, it's off. You know, it's, it's really, they're, they're denying it simply because it involves God. Right. And so, I can listen to your intelligent design, but now you're going to tell me that intelligent design is God. Well, if it's not God, then, you know, who is it? But the world's not going to accept any of this because they're spiritually, you know, dead. We read in Acts 17, 28. I don't know if I put this verse up here. Yes. For in him... We live and move, isn't that interesting? And have our being. Now, I'm gonna get back to this verse a little bit because it's gonna to go to one of our other um, arguments, you know, in a, in a second. But I just find it's fascinating that it tells us in Christ, in God, we live and move and have our being. Okay, the next argument, fancy name, is the axiological argument or the moral argument. And if you're a fan of C.S. Lewis, this is what he talks about, specifically in Mere Christianity. Is this moral argument points to concepts like good and evil, ethics and so forth. It's noticeable that these are discussions of what should be, not merely what is. Moral principles are drastically disconnected from the ruthless, selfish reasoning that one would expect in a creature that was randomly formed and evolved to survive at any cost. I mean, that's what Darwin said, is that it's survival of the fittest. And survival of the fittest, just think of that concept. What does survival of the fittest imply? Is the fittest meaning the healthiest? Fittest means what also? The strongest, meaning if there's one chicken I'm going to kill you so I can get the chicken and I'm going to survive and see that that where's the moral but but we know that's wrong and that's what that's what C.S. Lewis talks about in mere Christianity if you haven't read that in a while and I'm saying this to myself as well is I have his little series of the uh, the great divorce and mere Christianity and miracles and I forget the other two that come with it generally you need to read it again, Mere Christianity, because he speaks in there of you can go to any tribe in the world that has not been touched by, I hate to use the expression, white man, you know, civilized man, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Not had a missionary, not had any, the scientist, anyone come to him, and you sneak in and sit behind them at the campfire, and you will find out they have had no moral teaching from Christianity or any other religion they may be worshipping a totem pole as we spoke about a couple weeks ago in Romans 1 it's a false god they're denying the true god but you will find that in around that circle they will not encourage murder 
they look at stealing, they frown upon stealing. Cowardice is looked down upon. Um, taking advantage of your brother is not a, a, a positive thing. The point is, where did these moral constructs come from? Because especially if we're, we're pagan animals looking to survive, who's to say that murder is wrong? Now, there's plenty of people who do murder. You can be a part of the mafia, let's say, and murder may be encouraged of their enemies, but if so-and-so in your group is murdered, that gets them all upset. You can't do that. You know, you can steal from everyone else, but the moment you steal from that person, like, hey, you can, that's mine. You can't steal from me. Where does that come from? So it all goes back to the whole idea of we all have this sense of justice. We all demand justice. So there must be a moral or just originator of our innate moral compass. We don't live by the moral compass that we propose. You know what I'm saying? We all say, I should not steal. Somewhere along the line, we've all stolen. We know that we should not, I can't even think of any other sins, there's a thousand of them, a million of them, you know, whatever. You know, we know that's wrong, and yet we do the same thing or can do the same, same thing. And we have a sense within us that something is wrong. And even the most pagan unbelief. See, now, if you and I sin, what do you and I experience? Guilt. It's what, well, it's what Corinthians calls godly sorrow. Worldly guilt, in that verse, leads to death. The better word for it is godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is if I've sinned against you, if I was joking with Gary and I went too far and insulted him, Holy Spirit would whisper to me, Randy, that's your brother in Christ. That's me. You just insulted me. Please rectify that. Now, the Holy Spirit didn't say, Randy, you pagan heathen, I'm casting you out of into the sea of forgetfulness. And I'm going to discipline you like never before. And I can't believe you did that. And I don't even know if I love you anymore. See, that's the devil or the flesh speaking to you. The punitive self of you. The Holy Spirit is saying, no, correct that. That's godly sorrow. That's good. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. So the world, when they do wrong, they experience what? Worldly guilt. They know what they did was wrong. They know they just murdered someone. They know they just, you know, of course we're getting to the point now when there's riots and people steal television sets and stuff. I cannot imagine. I, that show you where the human heart has gotten. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That they think nothing of it. The, you, did you see the video? I've got to finish up here. The video the other day of some guy who literally, it's on camera, walked up to a stranger and belted him from behind in the neck. And I think the guy died. Yeah, fell, and hit his head. fell and hit his head and died. Unprovoked yeah. at all. Yeah. Clocked him and just took off. Yeah. Was it a theft no, no, nothing. No, nothing. Uh, nothing. Just. Initially he got let go. Yes, initially he got let go. Mm -hmm. I know, it's just it's a crazy world. Good will be seen as bad and bad will be seen as, as good. Okay, so Somewhere this, if, if we have laws, if we have this moral compass, then it's got to start somewhere. And God is the lawgiver. And God is the one who's laid this out, whether you look at it as the Ten Commandments or, or whatnot, is that the Ten Commandments are, oh man, Ten Commandments are wonderful. They want to take Ten Commandments out of the you know, courtrooms. Right. And you know what? I, I'll be honest with you. I, if, if you're not going to subscribe to it, don't be a hypocrite. You know, but I think it's important to have it in there yes. so people walk in and see. Right. You know, right, right there. But they don't want it in there because, again, it's God and it's pointing to the Romans. And I don't want to talk about that. Okay, the last thing I'm going to mention to you today, and 
it's the it's the toughest thing. So we're going to have to talk about it next week as well. But it, it is fascinating. And that's what's called the ontological argument. And it has to do with our existence, with our being, with us having awareness. It, um, and it, it gets down to God's, and we're going to look at this word another time, a seity, A-S-E-I-T-Y, is an attribute of God, his self-existence. That God has always existed. He cannot not exist. God will not die. Nietzsche said back in the, well, I think he said it earlier, about the 60s they picked up it. God is dead. And so that was a big movement. God is dead, like God died. What he was implying is that God never was alive, you know. But God is dead. You know, what a frightening thought. The truth is, with God's self-existence, with his being, with his, I promise we're going to talk about it next week. His necessary being is that you and I are alive. To, is it raining out? Okay. Well, because I'm hoping it'll pour and then you won't have any reason to run out. No. But I definitely want to wait and talk more about this. But this is where we get the terms, and I'll close with this, human being. Supreme being. We talk about God as a supreme being and we are human beings. And this comes from, this starts with back with Anselm back in the 12th century, a uh, deep th Christian thinker, you know, of, of God's essence, of his e eternality, that he has always lived, his self-existence, the simplicity of God, that we think God's so complicated, but he's actually very simple. All his attributes are all part of of one, well, we'll get to all into this as we move into specific attributes. But I wanted you to see, as I close here, and I promise I'll say, I won't bore you too much next week with the ontological, but I do want you to see it, because it's pretty cool when you understand it, you know, better, but I'm not gonna rush into it right now. But you can see from these philosophical arguments that were not written by Christians, necessarily. These have been thought about for many, many, many years. I will say this part about the ontological, about being. The best verse in the scripture, and there's a couple, one, couple of them, is when Moses was standing before the Lord at the burning bush. I want you to go tell everyone about me. Well, who do I say sent me? And what he says is important. Tell them I am sent you. And that makes absolutely no <laughs> grammatical sense. But when you think about it ontologically, it's like, whoa, he is saying the self-existent one sent you. They have other gods, which aren't gods at all. I'm the self-existent one, the only God. That's who you're going to tell them sent me. So there's proof of that, that this is not something that was come up in the last hundred years, whatever. Scriptures talked about it way before that, that God is his, the supreme being. I promise I'll tell you more about that next week. Okay, now, I personally was very excited to share all this with you. I don't know how you felt about it, you know? But I think this is essential in understanding, you know, how great our God is. When you realize that all law that we face in this world all stems from the perfect lawgiver. When all cause and effect in this universe is not some physics thing in a physics class, it all started with the prime mover. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the, the complexity, I would have loved to spend more time in that, of the human body, of just the human body. How does this all work? What are the chances? Unbelievers believe in a greater miracle than we do. <laughs> because they say something, you and I, came out of nothing. That's a, you know, literally meaning it just happened. And we say, no, the only reason we're here today is because someone who's perfect in wisdom, perfect in knowledge, perfect in his presence, perfect in his being, perfect in his love, perfect in his grace, perfect in his law, his protection of us, that he said, let there be light. Let there be people to walk on this earth. 
and it's just a glorious God that we serve. All right? Thank you for allowing me to get excited. If, if anything, I get blessed every time I do this. So, all right. Father, thank you for meeting here with us. I do pray that your saints were encouraged that, oh, sure, we learned some big words. But, Lord, help us to allow those big words, these deep concepts, concepts to draw, drive us to our knees. That, Father, we'll worship this great big God, this self-existent one that loved us enough to send himself through his son to die for us that we might be children of the living God. Father, what can, And as we were talking at the very beginning before everyone got here, what can we give the king? All we can give you is our hallelujahs. All we can give you is our life that you bought anyway. So Father, dismiss us now in your grace and love. Continue to use us to reflect your mercy to those we come in contact with. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you.